Okay, hi. Welcome everyone. My name is Lauren Bernard. For those of you who don't know me, I am co-president along with Ben Kelly of the Brookline Parents Organization, also known as the BPO. We are really very honored that so many people have registered for this event. Um, just a very quick quick uh, review of what the Brookline Parents Organization is. Uh, we, we, I'm, I'm a founding member. We created the organization in 2016. Um, but we were about a dozen parents at the time. And one of our principal goals has been to advocate for um, education and other types of initiative that we think are important to, um, to, to Brookline, to our students, our children, um, families, and teachers. And um, we try to have about two events a year. And uh, this one by far has the best attendance. Uh, we, we count over a thousand people. So uh, right currently we count six board members. Um, and, uh, you know, we're, we're, we're really in a good place right now to have such a great attendance tonight. So thank you. And I will turn this over to Ben. And I, I'm eager to hear all of your questions and see how the discussion goes. Thank you again. Hi, I'm, I'm Ben Kelly. I am the uh, other co-president of the Brookline Parents Organization. Um, and again, thank you all for, for joining us. Um, we put this together on, on you know, very short notice. Um, because of all the news that was that was happening, and um, so we're we're glad that that you know we were able to provide some kind of forum to have a discussion about what's happening in our in our schools right now. Um, and as Lauren said, we really hope that this is uh, productive and and helpful for for the community, and that we can use this as a way to figure out how we can get all of our teachers back as quickly as possible, um, all of our educators. Um, so we've received so many emails in the past um, like 30 hours, 24 hours, something like that since we announced this with questions. Um, and thank you everybody for your questions. I apologize. I don't think we got to write back to the half of you just um, in the time that, that we've that we've had, um, but um, you know we've we've tried to compile as many questions as possible, um, and we're and I know that you know Meg is going to try to get to as many questions as possible, and also we're going to make sure that um, that we monitor the Q and A. So any questions that you have, please ask in the Q and A, and you know obviously we're going to fit as many questions in in with the time we have, but um, I think there's yeah almost a thousand of you on, and so if we don't get to your question, I apologize in advance. Um, and, you know, we're some parents and we're doing this and we've never hosted a webinar before. So please be patient with any technical <laughs> challenges along the way, but I, I hope we'll be fine. Um, and lastly, um, you know, we've done, as Lauren said, we've done, you know, events in person before. We've never done a big kind of online event like this. Um, but, you know, we're thinking about what what kind of events like this we can do in the future. And, and we're hoping that we can bring other stakeholders and other members of the community together to do this um, in, in the future. So with that, I will um, say that we're very honored to have um, Suzanne Fetterspiel and David Perlman here, um, uh, elected members of the Brookline School Committee. Um, Representative Tommy Vitolo has um, agreed to join us as well in case that there are any questions that go directly to things at the state level um, that we can, we can talk about um, that can maybe help fund our schools. Um, and lastly, thank you so much to, to Meghna Chakravarti for agreeing to, to moderate this discussion. We're uh, very um, thankful that you're able to do this. So um, I'll give it to Meghna. Enjoy, thank you. Uh, well, that is not Meghna. <laughs> uh, thank you, Ben and Lauren for inviting me to join everyone today. Uh, first of all, I just want to uh, state clearly that I am not a member of the BPO, but when Ben and Lauren extended this opportunity to me, I jumped at the chance because as many of you know, I have spent um, the better part of the last year attending as many school committee meetings as I could to figure out sort of how, how it works uh, in our school district because uh, my first and most important job is as a Lauren's mom to a fourth grader 
here. And uh, to an incoming kindergartner as well. So if you just hold on for one second, I'm going to ask my fourth grader to sit down for a minute. Can you sit down, sweetie? Please, because I just need to be able to focus, okay? Um, so, uh, so what I want to just say, first of all, is to the more than 1,000 people watching this already, thank you so much for taking the time to join us this evening. I know there's a lot going on in everyone's lives, everyone's family's lives. There's a lot going on in this town. There's a lot going on in this country. Um, and it's, all of it is painful and difficult and hard. So the fact that all of us made time to come together in these imperfect circumstances to see if we can collectively find some answers and move forward, I think is incredibly meaningful. And um, it gives me great hope. So thank you to everyone who is watching this or who may watch this later on when it is posted. Now also just on a slightly lighter note, the fact that there are more than 1,000 people attending this uh, meeting, Suzanne and um, David, that means that the only event that I've ever done that's bigger than this was with Amy Poehler. So you guys were right up there with Saturday Night Live. That was with 15,000 people at Northeastern University. So you're my number two most attended event, which just shows how important all of this is. So how this is going to work is we have received um, many questions from the community thus far. We will certainly receive more um, and in the next roughly hour and a half. Uh, I have my own questions as well. So I will sort of weave them all together and roughly we're going to have a conversation that comes in four parts. What happened, why it happened, what it means, and what do we do? Those are roughly the four parts. Um, and before we get started, let me just formally introduce you so you can just quickly say a hello and some remarks. So first of all, Suzanne Federspiel, um, School Committee Vice Chair, welcome and thank you for joining us at this event today. Yeah, thank you so much. Thank you everyone for coming. I know, I know how important this is if we have 1,000 people watching. I think that's, that's a tribute to uh, people giving up their time on a Sunday evening in these, as Magnus said, very difficult times. And I, I do appreciate the time, I must say, I appreciate all the emails, uh, even the arrows that come flying our way. We need to hear from people. Uh, I, I am not able to respond to all of them because we get so many, but I do read them all. So, so thank you for that. And just a quick note to say that uh, uh, I am here, as is David, as members of the school committee, and we are going to share as much information as we can. We are not formally speaking for the school committee, but certainly we are um, giving you what we can as school committee members. So thank you. Thank you for so having me. Not speaking for the entirety of the nine yes, members. That's, school right. committee. that's how we said that, yeah. And David Perlman, welcome to you. Thank you for being with us tonight. Thank you. So I'm David Perlman. I've been on the school committee for uh, two years now. I'm the current chair of the policy subcommittee. I myself am an alum of the Brookline Schools. I'm a child welfare attorney. And to follow up on what Suzanne just said, I also welcome the emails and input that I'm receiving from members of the community, even those that can sometimes be toned a little harshly, I still appreciate it. And the reason I say that is because it heartens me to see just how many people care this strongly about our educators, about our children, about our school system, all the different stakeholders that want to come together and find a solution. So that has given me some cause for optimism. So thank you both again. And um, so we have about an hour and 15 minutes roughly to cover as much ground as we can. So what I'll do is I'll, I'll ask you some questions. I might, uh, I'll try to direct them to either of you, but if I direct it to the wrong person, the other one to speak up, up to you. Um, I'll add my own questions in. Um, sometimes I might prod you along uh, to reach the end of a thought because there's a lot of ground that we'd like to cover. And I, it's incredible to me that there are a thousand people here. So this could be a quite an impactful conversation. So well, let's just dive right in. I mean, the, look, the first several questions that people submitted have everything to do with why now? Why all of a sudden at the, at the end of May, um, with the instability that the, dis the district is already facing, with the difficulty that parents and families have in supporting their kids, with the challenges that educators have and teachers have in doing their work. Why did the town, someone's asking why did the town or possibly the school committee need to do this, meaning the pink slips for teachers now? 
Suzanne, would you like to take that one? Sure, I'll start and David can fill in, take some notes, David, where I, the pieces I either get wrong or I, I forget about. So, you know, we, we start the budget process like in December for the, for the following year. We always do that. And it has to be ready for a town meeting. So what happens is, is that the town gives us the amount of money that we need, the appropriations that we are going to have for our budget. And we knew back in January, February, uh, that we were going to be short uh, a million or a couple million is, is what was projected. And so we were starting to have conversations about what that would look like and how we would do it. And then with the, uh, the uh, pandemic, COVID-19 uh, and the shutdown, not only of our schools, but of, of the businesses, uh, the town took a look at the revenues and what's coming in and the projections. And we get a lot of, most of our money comes from real estate, property taxes, but we do get a fair amount of money from um, parking meters and fines and restaurants and sales tax and those kinds of things. And uh, we were told May 13th, or May 15th, something like that, May 15th, I guess, that um, we were going to be short $6 million in our budget from what we thought. So essentially they gave us the amount of money that was $300,000 less than what we have this year. And Suzanne, can I just jump in here? So this is a point of confusion, I think, in the community, and maybe I'll let David pick it up from here. Uh, and that is, so there was already a structural deficit even before COVID, right? Yes, that was that, a, talking about, yeah. the one identified in, Janu in December of November, December last year. Yeah. There were some decisions made to close that deficit. Then the pandemic hits, and so the $6 million that you referenced uh, is on top of that. Is that correct, David? No, no, it's a total of six million. A total of six million, including the structural deficit from before? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay. Yeah. Okay. okay. David, um, can I continue? Yeah, go ahead, David. Yes, yeah, so just uh, some even more specific numbers. In Brookline, about 71% of the revenue we receive is from property taxes. So that means that 29% of the revenue we would ordinarily have we essentially stopped getting most of it due to the economic shutdown related to the pandemic. So on May 15th, the town came to the schools and essentially said, we now have this uh, deficit, projected deficit that's greater than 12 million, and you're going to have to come up with 6.3 of that. So then we uh, had to try to figure out how are we going to come up with 6.3 million? The community has uh, talked a lot about the need for cuts to central office. And I personally endorse making additional cuts to central office. I believe that other members of the committee do as well. However, even if we cut all of central office, that still wouldn't get us to $6 million. We also had the additional constraint that the BEU contract requires that anyone who we intend to notice with reduction in force, uh, RIF notices, needed to, needed to receive those by May 30th. And unfortunately, the guidelines from the state as to what school will look like for the following year are not going to come out until mid-June at the earliest. It could even be July. Uh, so that created some logistical difficulties for us in being able to figure out what are some other pots of money from different areas beyond what's within our own control that we could perhaps access. The state operates under a, a different calendar. The uh, federal government, we can't necessarily assume that federal funds will come in in timely fashion. And even within the town, the school committee is given an appropriation by town meeting. We have to work within that appropriation. So any discussions that would occur with the town require obviously to be able to work with the advisory committee with town meeting. So we found ourselves under those constraints. So that's the, mm -hmm. the reason for why now. Okay, so I'd like to then um, peel back some layers here and get as much clarity as possible. Sure. So first of all, why, so you have, six million is the number, but we're seeing people um, say that the number of pink slips sent out when take you know if all of those um, educators were to let go, it would be a twenty million dollar um, saving. So why send out so many when it's more than the when it totals to more than the six million that you need uh, 
to the six million gap that you need to close. So one of the reasons for that is teachers are at different places in their career. So we have those who are at pre-professional status and we have those who essentially are tenured. And in order to maintain flexibility, both programmatically and in terms of knowing exactly who would slot in where, it becomes very difficult on such short notice to identify who exactly has licenses in areas that we would need. Um, so, for example, if we hypothetically were looking to uh, terminate a gym teacher, and that gym teacher happens to be licensed to teach second grade, the gym teacher, a, a pre-professional status teacher would need to be let go ahead of that gym teacher, which means the gym teacher would slide in to teaching second grade. We would need to then find a second grade teacher who's pre-professional status, and that person would uh, be terminated. Uh, so we don't really know exactly who has what status because you have to check their contract, of course. You have to double check with DESE whether the license is still active. You then have to see what the needs are at each school. So there are a lot of variables in play. And to be able to do that for every individual within a two week time span, it, it was impractical. Were there other alternatives though that the district or the school committee could have considered? Like people, someone's wondering why a layoff instead of furlough? Suzanne? So furlough, furloughs are required to be negotiated. Uh, so there are certainly a lot of options that we have considered. Uh, some of which I can't go into because they occurred in executive session, executive session or during the course of collective bargaining. Uh, but there are a variety of options that we were pursuing. But legally, a furlough is not something that the schools can impose upon educators. It has to be negotiated. Suzanne, do you want to add to that? Well, so the, the thing is, is that we need as much flexibility as possible. And so it's not that... Uh, we just don't know at this point uh, who might uh, be laid off and who wouldn't. I mean, ideally, nobody will be because uh, our, our student population will, will remain the same. So it's not like we can cut classes and, um, and uh, lay off teachers that way. What we don't know is, again, what school will look like in the fall. So if school is either a remote or a hybrid, it's possible that we might uh, make some, some changes in assignments for people uh, based on that. But people need to know that really our goal is to have everyone come back. And uh, it's, it's not so common now, but it used to be quite common, those of us who have been educators over the years, especially uh, a, lot, a while ago, to get pink slips at this time of year. Um, because that just gives the district uh, flexibility again on how they, they assign teachers to particular classrooms or even schools. So um, if anyone out there watching wants to correct me, you know, give us a shout on the Q&A, but I'm wondering, I haven't heard of that many other districts taking this move, okay? Because ideal, I mean, ostensibly, everyone in Massachusetts is, fa is facing at least a similar set of, cha of challenges. Um, but I'm not sure if I heard of a broad-based um, pink slip or, or RIF, as it's called, move like Brookline made. Um, so when you say we don't know what school is going to look like, w were there, I mean, why did we opt for this move when other districts haven't? Well, in response to that directly, the contracts vary between districts. Yeah. So in the BEU contract, initially it was actually an even earlier date. And fortunately, the BEU did extend it uh, somewhat to May 30th. But even May 30th is before what most other districts set. And these, at the state level, the most typical, uh, the, the statute says it has to be by June 15th. Uh, so I would expect, actually, that we will see similar moves in many other districts in the coming weeks as they run up against their deadlines for issuing uh, RIFs. Suzanne, did you want to add to that? Well, I, I, well, I, that is right. I mean, that's what we're, I expect that we're going to hear uh, this happening in other districts as their deadlines come up because the contracts are different from district to district. And, um, you know, we, this isn't the only 
uh, approach we're using. So, you know, we are still talking to, uh, as I think David said, you know, the advisory board, uh, select board, the town, the town manager, uh, to see what we can do uh, about the money. And, if, and in fact, it's actually quite a fluid situation. So, um, you know, the day after we, the slips went out, uh, we learned that the town may try to uh, reallocate $2 million back into our budget. Or, so, so it's really fluid. I, I think people need to understand that I know that these are pink slips, I know that they are layoffs, but our intent is not to have people come back. Our intent is to have people come back. I mean, that's, that's what we, we, we couldn't fill all these roles if they were, um, if, if, if the people left, if our staff left, we would not be able to fill all those positions, nor do we want that to happen. We want our teachers to stay. Okay, so, um... Lots of follow-ups there. We'll, we'll come back to the other sources of revenue, a potential revenue question a little bit later. Uh -huh. But um, are you or David concerned that since the pink slips have gone out, um, we may have teachers who are starting to look elsewhere um, out, of, out of concern about how unstable the situation seems here in Brookline. Mm -hmm. Could we lose valued teachers in this district? You know, it, there, there is that possibility, yeah. and it is something that weighs very heavily on me personally. Yeah. Uh, even though it is our intention, and our superintendent uh, said at the last public meeting that there is no universe under which the vast majority of these educators wouldn't be back in time for the fall, but that's still not going to be any consolation to those who right now are wondering about themselves individually and their and their colleagues and that doubt and that uncertainty and the impact that has on future planning. Uh, of course, that's very difficult and very distressing. Uh, it makes these decisions very difficult. However, we do need to maintain that flexibility as Suzanne was mentioning, because without knowing what school is going to look like in the fall, it would be a dereliction of our collective responsibilities in my view to not allow ourselves maneuverability to ensure that every child receives a free and appropriate public education. One of our core responsibilities is to ensure that every child in our district receives that free and appropriate public education. That's under federal law. And we don't know what the requirements are going to be. We're not going to know them until July. So it's very frustrating that we had to uh, make these decisions prior to knowing what the environment will look like. Mm. Uh, but yes, I definitely understand why this has got to be painful for a lot of teachers. And it's my hope that as we continue to try to identify other funds and the fluidity of the situation, as Suzanne alluded to, that we'll be able to, at minimum, truncate this period of uncertainty. So just, just to clarify one thing, when you said we don't know what it's going to look like and What's, what the guidance may be until July. This is guidance that you're waiting for from the Department of Elementary and Secondary Education. Where is the guidance coming from? Yes, yeah, from, from Jesse, Jesse. Jesse. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Magna, if I could just say, you know, if, as terrible as this is, uh, I, I've actually been there. I mean, as an educator, I was pink slipped and, and I was told, don't worry, you will, you will have a job. But you know, I, I know how that feels. I still went out looking because you know, I'm just you're nervous. If you're the if if you're the one with the benefits and, and you're the one with the, the paycheck, it's really important. So, you know, I know that that I am committed and I know many other school committee members are committed to try to get some of this resolved as soon as possible. Um, mm. We may not get everything resolved, but I would like, you know, the bulk of that resolved in terms of you know, allow, you know, allowing teachers to know that they are coming back. And I would like to add to that, that we've actively been working on resolving this even before the May 30th deadline. So every week, there's a town school partnership meeting. And what occurs during those meetings, school committee members are having discussions with those on the town side, advisory committee, town meeting members, select board members, the town administrator, Mel Kleckner. And there are discussions about how we can uh, increase our appropriation, how we can slide certain funds from elsewhere into the school side, what we can maybe defer. There are very detailed financial considerations that go into 
trying to balance the budget and trying to find a, a less painful way to meet our obligation of submitting a balanced budget because state law prohibits us from deficit spending. Mm. So, so since the revenue, all other revenue sources question has come up multiple times just in our conversation thus far, let me ask you, people want to know, um, there seems to be some evidence that Brookline has a $26 million, I don't know if we can call the whole thing a rainy day fund, but at least there's, there is a, a rainy day fund of some kind. Could the district access the, that, those funds? And if so, how would that be made to happen? So the way the district would be able to access those funds is through town meeting. That's something that town meeting needs to do. And again, unfortunately, with the constraints of time, town meeting's not meeting until late June. Uh, so that is something that town meeting could take up. But at this point, as school committee members, we don't have direct control over that. We can make recommendations. We can have discussions with people, which we actively do already. But that's a town meeting function. So I'm going to presume that there are many town meeting members probably watching right now. I mean, are you making a direct request to them? Uh, I don't know if you can, since you're not representing the full school committee, but what would you tell them? Well, you know, I would ask them to uh, stay on top of the situation. I mean, I think that we will want to, I mean, we are working with advisory committee, we're, work, we're working with the select board, we're working with the town manager, and you know, we will do our very best to put a, a package together that, that works and that we ask that they be informed and uh, talk to their other town meeting members. David's one and actually some, I think someone else in the school committee, but um, to, to you know, work with us and, and, and to make this happen. We don't know yet what that's gonna look like exactly, um, but, but to stay informed so that when the questions come up, we can have a good conversation about it. So I promise everyone that there are other, um, revenue sources or areas of investigation that I'll come back and, and ask you two about um, in a few minutes. But there are many, many questions uh, about the specificity or the different areas in which those, the pink slips went out. And, um, and I think we, we've got to go through some of these just to get the, the, the truth about what is happening here. I mean, just broadly speaking, someone asks this question um, in the message that was sent out on May 29th from the school committee. Uh, it states that no programs have been cut. Would you clarify what that means when most of all teachers from some departments have received pink slips? So sure. when the superintendent said that there's no universe un under which most of these individuals would not be, most of our educators would not be returning in the fall, Yes, there, a lot of these slips were sent sometimes to uh, everyone within a, a certain uh, discipline. But we have every intention of making sure that by fall, each of these departments are staffed to some level. We don't know what that level will be. We don't know exactly what, again, what education is gonna look like in each discipline. But for example, with BEAT, there absolutely will be a BEAT program come fall. We are very committed to BEEP. I'm personally committed to BEEP. I attended BEEP as well when it was called Transition to Kindergarten. Uh, I, I definitely cherish that program. We are also required under state law to offer special education services to those who are between uh, 2.9 and age five. So the reason I mention that is when we have certain state mandates, when we have certain commitments, we will have staff. So just because uh, we've cast a, a broader net in terms of the RIFs that went out does not mean that no one will be coming back from that category. Okay, so let me just pry with on that a little bit because you just said there will be a BEAT program in the fall um, that, uh, that the services that the district is required to provide to, to other students um, mandated by the state that those services will be provided. So why did every teacher in BEEP get a pink slip. I mean, if, it's, if there's going to be a BEEP program, why did you just not send them pink slips at all? I think people are really confused about that. Well, I, I think it is confusing. And uh, because for, for BEEP in particular, Magna, we, we don't know what BEEP will look like in the fall. So if everybody is back in school, we're all in the buildings and it's, life is normal as usual, 
the B program will look just like it's looking. And all those people will be um, brought back. If by chance, uh, the, ch the state says, you know, we can't do early childhood the way we usually do it. And so the, the B programs have to be in more classrooms, not in, in you know, and spread out. You know, we may even need more BEEP teachers. I mean, that's possible. It's also possible that since BEEP in particular is a tuition-based program for our typical children, that there may be uh, fewer people enrolling their children in BEEP, in which case the BEEP program for the fall may be smaller. And then, uh, so that we would not need as many classes. And we do not know at this time which classes we would actually have. We, we just don't know. We don't know what the state's going to allow. And so we don't know exactly what that will look like. So in this, as we said, we did this broad rush. It's unfortunate, but we did a broad rush to everybody because we don't know which uh, classrooms are going to be opening and which will not. We, mm. we may actually have more demand for BEEP because other child care centers may, may be closing. So there may be more demand, but there may be less if, if the state doesn't really allow us to have a full program. If we go to, if we're still at remote learning or if we are hybrid, we, we just, we don't know what that's going to look like yet. Okay, so there's a whole series of questions which may start sounding a little bit similar, but to do justice to them, I, want, I do want to actually go through them because people really want to know about why um, health and wellness, why arts, why music, why it seemed like these, these were the areas where the pink slips were going out. For, so for example, we have um, a question about uh, someone specifically referring to librarians, art, PE, um, and the person says their understanding of this issue comes from a discussion at a particular school that included at least 39 educators, um, that there may be other departments as well. However, teachers in those specific departments spoke about the scale of layoffs regarding their colleagues, some of whom have been Brookline for 10 years, maybe longer. Uh, and then the person said, in addition to layoffs, another factor to consider is that departments are also losing faculty through attrition, which in most years would be normal. Those teachers are not included in the current layoff data. So the person wants to know, it seems a little disingenuous and perhaps intentionally misleading to publicly state that no programs have been cut, given that if you combine the attrition with the pink slips, there will be no or few teachers remaining within a given department. So again, if I could just jump in, if we are back to school as normal, whatever that is, and everybody's back in their buildings and they're there full time, there will not be layoffs with librarians, PE, art. We need all those people, right? They need to be there. If we go back and it's remote learning or it is a hybrid. Well, I'm not so sure what hybrid is going to look like. So that's a little hard to predict. But let's say we go back and it's remote learning like we've had this year. Then it's possible that we would need fewer uh, PE teachers and that, or art teachers and that perhaps one, two, or three might uh, do uh, synchronous, asynchronous teaching videos that they could then use with a broader number of students. And so the, the idea is that we were thinking, what would remote learning look like? And how would that work in our budget? And you know, would there be some savings, quite frankly, mm -hmm. uh, with teachers that would work together to uh, present their materials, but probably not everybody. So there would be some consolidation. So I, before I ask my next question, I want to reiterate my appreciation to both of you for coming and talking with us. Um, this is hard and you're being very generous with the information you're providing, so thank you. That said, <laughs> with all due respect, um, this is, I'm trying to think of the right word. I was going to say confusing, but I'm not even sure confusing is the, is the right word. This seems, some of it seems a little hard to believe because under the scenario you just described, Suzanne, like say if there's hybrid uh, or all online learning come fall, what is the logic that we still actually need fewer educators, period? Because right now we still have, we, 
we have everyone in the district who's working for the district trying to get online learning to work and it feels like we need every single one of them um, for any parent who's uh, tried to assist their, their learner or any family member who's tried to assist their learner, um, it's, I, I would think that quite frankly, um, online learning requires more adults <laughs> rather than fewer. That we can't just like scale it up the way that we might think um, we can scale up a great video conference like this with a thousand people because learning is different than just, it, than, than what we're doing now. So what is the logic at all that we would need any fewer educators come the fall really well we aren't thinking talking about fewer classroom teachers that we know that that will not go down because as you said we may need even more and so it's possible it's possible that as david talked about the pe teacher um may be asked to go in and help in the second grade or something i mean it we just don't know Many of what that's going to look like in the fall, just like we've struggled a little bit this spring to figure this out with remote learning. And we are just looking to have as much flexibility as we can to pro provide a program that is best for our children. It, and it may be, it may be we need more people, which it will be difficult with the budget. We don't know, we really don't know. We, there are um, task force looking into all of these areas, looking into a remote setting, into hybrid and into a full return and what that might look like. So, so you are right. We, it, we may need more. We, we just don't know, but we need, we felt we needed the flexibility at this time because we had the deadline that said, if there's a possibility that we might do some reassigning, rearranging, we needed to get that out by May 30th. It's again, it's giving us that flexibility. I know that's that word, but to help us make the right decisions, that, the best decisions we can. David, did you want to? Yes, that, again, that flexibility really is critically important because, as I mentioned earlier, about the federal mandate for free and appropriate public education for every student, that becomes a particularly uh, large challenge in the ambit of special education because how do you provide for IE for all types of IEPs through remote learning? It's a challenge. So that could mean that we're going to have to actually increase our staff in special education. If you're going to increase your staff in one area and you're working within a limited appropriation, then realistically that means that money's got to come from somewhere. So maybe that comes from physical education uh, maybe that comes from somewhere else. We need to figure that all out. But in order to be able to uh, reassign staff into other areas to make sure that each skill set is covered so that each child is getting that education that he or she is entitled to receive, we need to maintain that flexibility. Hmm. Uh, so a couple more just specific uh, content areas or learning areas that people want to know about. I'll I'm going to guess that your answers will be similar, but if, if you have different answers for any of them, please let me know. First of all, someone wants to know why have school nurses been laid off? If there's any employee of a school that needs to be there to help with planning and assessing regarding partial reopening, it would be healthcare workers in our district. Suzanne? Yeah, so, so if we are back in school, certainly our nurses will not be laid off. Uh, and they will, in fact, we, they may need more help, right? If we don't know what those requirements will be, but if it's testing, uh, if it's temperature taking every day, I mean, it's, that would be a, a massive labor intensive endeavor, which we may have to do. We don't know, we don't know. So again, uh, but if we are remote uh, learning, um, it's possible that uh, the nurses will not have as much to do. I mean, they, you know, maybe they'll do more work with the social workers or something, follow up with families, uh, but they will not be able to see the children. And a lot of what they do that's so important and critical is, is seeing the children. I mean, the children will not be coming to their offices sick every day, right? They're at home. So it's, it doesn't mean that they're not important. It means is that the best place for them and is that the best way to use their talents? And you know, it may be that they will they would be a temporarily uh, laid off. I mean, it's possible, right? If we're not in school, it's possible. Uh, more questions about health and wellness and PE. Um, is it true that PE or health and wellness was eliminated 
district wide? Um, isn't there a state mandate um, for health and wellness? Also, there's a Brookline wellness policy that was put into effect in July of 2018. Uh, David, did you have a response to that? Yes, so this gets back to that issue I was talking about in the context of BEAT, where just because you issue RIFs to everyone within a certain discipline does not mean it's anticipated that there will not be staffing to some degree within that area. There, there will be physical education in some fashion. We don't know what that will look like because it does depend obviously whether we are physically in the buildings or whether it would be physical education by remote learning. Uh, as Suzanne referenced earlier, physical education through remote learning might not necessarily require as many uh, gym teachers as we currently have at this moment. So in order to maintain, again, there's that word flexibility for who goes where, uh, that's why it, it's done this way in terms of sending out the RIFs by category. So again, there will be physical education instruction to some degree. So that's why uh, it, it is consistent to say that a program is not eliminated just because most or all educators within that area have received this notice. Mm. Notification. If so, I can add, if, well, we just try very hard not to use the word eliminate because we, we are not eliminating programs. We're not eliminating uh, PE, we're not a wellness, we're not eliminating art. It may be, as David said, we need flexibility and it may look different if we're in remote learning. Um, so that's the thinking. I suppose uh, it's a matter of semantics. <laughs> Flex well, flexibility, look different. I mean, you're saying that there still is the possibility, though, that there will be some, uh, some teachers who are not called back. Uh, yes, I, there, will be, there is that possibility. We're hoping it's few. Uh, if, as we said, if we got more money, we could hire more people. But yeah, there is, there is that possibility. I mean, we're not saying there's no possibility with that. Okay, so, so then practically speaking though, um, even though it seems mid-July, some guidance might come from the state, um, we do have this town meeting on, on June 23rd, right? Where I believe some kind of budget needs to be presented to town meeting. So what's the timeline for teachers to know what is going to happen? Could, it ha could, there, could there be some decisions or will there be some decisions made you know, in the next week, the next two weeks. David? I do think that there will be additional decisions made. So for example, the uh, contracts in central office were not subject to this May 30th deadline. There will be discussions about potential, about potential additional cuts for central office. There will be continuing discussions with the advisory committee about a possible reserve fund transfer with uh, the town administrator about other funds from the town side that could perhaps slide into the school side. That's already been happening and it's going to continue to happen. And then at town meeting, uh, there, is, there is that opportunity to tap into the stabilization funds if that's what town meeting so desires. Uh, so there are a lot of things that could happen prior to town meeting, at town meeting, and after town meeting because there are all these different potential sources for revenue that would help us uh, be able to retain more of our staff and perhaps even add. So that's a long time period to continue to ask people to live with this, with what is essentially a profound amount of uncertainty. Now we, we're all living in an uncertain world right now. L let that be noted. But it sounds like you're talking about a month, six weeks perhaps, maybe even more of not really knowing what the shape of the district is going to be in the fall. Is that a fair statement, David? It might not be long for everybody. So again, depending on what the individual educator's position is, we might have more clarity about uh, some disciplines more so than others. For example, if you are a social studies teacher, obviously we're going to have social studies, whether it's remote learning, whether it's hybrid. So there are certain areas that I believe we could clarify uh, quite soon, and I'm hopeful that we will do that. And if I might add, uh, you know, there, there will be a budget that is approved by town meeting uh, the week of June 23rd. So we will know what that budget is. Uh, we are uh, deliberating on that budget tomorrow night. Uh, 
Superintendent Lummis is going to present it at our school committee meeting, so people should tune in to listen to that. And we are having a public comment on Thursday, this coming Thursday on the budget as well. So it is part of the process and you know, as that moves along, we will have a better sense of how many we can bring back at what, in what time frame. You know, we still won't know everybody, everybody, as much as I would like to, most likely until we have a better picture of what the school is gonna look like in the fall. Okay, so there, is a, there are many groups, but I'm thinking of one in particular that I think this uncertainty is gonna be very challenging to deal with because we've received several questions about uh, materials fees students mm -hmm. uh, whose parents were given pink slips. They, people want to know if you, if you can assure them that these children can stay in the public schools of Brookline at least for the 2020-21 year even when there's so much uncertainty. One person specifically says it's too late for many people to secure another place in another school for the next school year. Yeah. So I, do you have an answer on that, David? I mean, we, we have brought this up, so we are thinking about it, but I don't believe that we have uh, come down with a definitive response to that. But I do know it, it's our hope that people, uh, those children can stay with us, uh, but we have not, I cannot speak to the whole school committee at this point on that one. What would the process be to make that answer a yes? School committee would have to vote in favor of it. What I can say, uh, I've been chair of the policy subcommittee for not that long, only less than a month, but even in that time, I've been very committed to school stability for children. So a couple of policies that we have been working on that will be presented for public comment involve students in foster care and students who are homeless. And in both of those policies, I, I made sure that we have a provision that would allow for that stability for students to be able to remain in their school in Brookline, even if they are no longer uh, in Brookline for some period of time afterwards. So if they're out of foster care or if they're moved to another district. And it's my expectation that a similar approach would be taken here. Uh, that's at least something that I would personally advocate for as a uh, child welfare attorney who works with children in foster care. It's extremely important to me. And uh, it's important to children who are in any situation have stability. Uh, with the development taking place at Hancock Village, I've been involved in that as well to try to ensure that children who have been relocated temporarily to, West, to the West Roxbury side of Hancock Village can continue to attend the Brookline schools. Uh, so that's certain school stability I would certainly push for. And I'm hopeful that the committee will take that up quickly. So for the 1,000 people watching, David Perlman is the one to send emails about that, about, <laughs> the, uh, about materials fees students, which is really important because it, I mean, it's, it's, a, it's a crucial demonstration of our commitment to every child uh, who is a member of the public schools of Brookline. Um, now, listen, we- staff staff as well. Imagine. Sorry, and, and there's that, that's right. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, it's something we really do believe in. So uh, I just, I, I need to ask if, can you, regarding central administration, the letter that went out on May 29th uh, from the school committee noted uh, a proposal of $1.5 million in cuts to central administration. Can, people would like more clarity on what those cuts are, if at all possible. Suzanne? I don't know that we can say that, can we, David? <laughs> the proposed cuts that have been made and, uh, some of which have already been approved, but they occurred in executive session. So that's yeah. not something that we can yet announce, but I, I can confirm that yes, there was an affirmative vote to eliminate some positions in central office. And I expect that there will be uh, more to come. Okay, so lots of interesting questions here coming in um, actually specifically from teachers. Gary Schiffman, the social studies chair uh, at Brookline High School says, we were prepared to manage the 5% budget reduction through normal processes without gutting programs or issuing blanket layoffs. Management of the budget was taken out of our hands with the present results. Why? I guess I would not like to ask him uh, what he means he was ready to manage that. Uh, I'm, not, I'm not sure what he means. I mean, uh, is he talking about through nego contract negotiations? Is he, I mean, maybe he'll, he'll write back to you. Uh, is he talking about uh, department heads looking to uh, 
reduce their budget by 5%. I'm not, I'm not sure what he meant by that. Okay, uh, well, Gary, I presume you're still watching, so just send us a follow-up on that, and I'll come back to it when we can get that. Uh, okay, so let's talk a little bit more then about uh, other ways to close this budget gap without losing a single educator. So we discussed whether or not the rainy day fund mm -hmm. could be part of this picture. Um, I obviously there's a there's some questions and maybe this is our opportunity to get um, Representative Vitolo in here because folks want to know if there's a possibility. Hello, Tommy. Welcome um, for um, for revenue or additional funds from the state. And if so, how would that happen? Sure. Um, and I'm also happy to explain why the Brookline budget crisis is in fact more severe than almost every other community in the Commonwealth. But I'll answer your question first. And that is the bulk of money that comes from the state to the cities and towns for education is called chapter 70 money. And that's the money that we, the legislature passed earlier this year, a promise to dramatically expand over the next seven years. Uh, and obviously that was before COVID happened. The state normally would have its first house iteration of the budget done in April. And we haven't even gotten there yet. So we're well behind. We don't know how much money the state will pass on to cities and towns this coming year. The last fiscal crisis, the sort of 2007, 2008, state aid to cities and towns was cut pretty severely. And there's no reason to think it won't happen again this time. And so what I think you're seeing is rightfully so, um, the municipalities being conservative about how much money they're going to get from the state. I hope it's more. I hope we're able to find more. But just like the town, the state can't operate in a deficit either. And the state tax revenues, which rely heavily on income tax, are way down because unemployment is 25%. And so we've got to tr do our best to uh, find money and decide what we're going to harm the most and what we're going to harm the least but nothing is getting out of this budget unscathed at the state level or at the municipal level. The money's simply not there without federal action because the federal government can deficit spend. The federal government can print money. States and towns cannot. We can't spend more than we have. And we can raise yeah. taxes with an override though at the so, local level. Well, so let's come back to that in a second, but about um, possibility of uh, additional federal aid to state budgets, um, my understanding is that the House has passed a bill, but it's, it's stalled in the Senate. The Senate Majority Leader Mitch McConnell is not advancing a bill that would provide considerable assistance to state budgets. Is that right? That's right. And believe it or not, uh, Majority Leader McConnell doesn't take my phone calls either. It doesn't take mine either. Um, so, okay. So, well, but I mean, that's not to say that people, that, that citizens should not advocate uh, at the federal level for, for, that, for that bill to advance um, in, the, in the Senate. Now, you were saying about an override, Tommy. Yep. So uh, the town can choose to raise its own property taxes above and beyond a two and a half percent to generate extra operating revenue. Realistically, the earliest the town could vote that is the September 1 primary, which is not especially helpful for a school that starts right around September 1, um, but it could be very helpful, certainly for the second semester and possibly later into the first semester. It's really tricky to figure out exactly how that would work, um, but that's a possibility. The question is, are residents of Brookline, many of whom um, are making less income than they were three months ago, willing to vote in favor of an override? And I don't know the answer to that question. Uh, so, I suppose only citizens themselves can answer that, but so September 1st, you said, is the earliest it could appear on a ballot. I think that's right. We're having an election September 1st anyway, and so to try to put it on the ballot before that is really hard. Um, it takes time to plan for an election. It takes time to propose an override amount, explain it, for the select board to then vote to put it on the ballot, and then to have a campaign where citizens can have a debate. All of that takes time. And so to imagine getting that done earlier than September 1st 
feels unlikely to me and probably not worth the pain of putting together an election for some time in August when we're going to have a vote on September 1st anyway. Mm. So you were going to say, you said a little earlier that you, you could explain why um, Brookline is in a more dire financial situation than other districts? You bet. There's, there's a couple of important reasons why. First of all, um, and, and uh, so, uh, school committee member and vice chair Federspiel got at this a little bit earlier. Brookline has, what, 2,500 or 3,000 parking meters. Most cities and towns in Massachusetts have fewer than 100, right? And so that's not just the meters that are a buck and a quarter an hour and not 50 cents an hour like in some parts of the state. It's also the meter expired fees and fines that go with it. Brookline has the single highest volume retail marijuana shop in the country. And the tax revenue from that is substantial. No other community in Massachusetts has that substantial uh, sales from retail recreational marijuana. Brookline, relative to its, to its size, relative to, to the number of people who live here, has a remarkably large number of restaurants and hotel rooms. Most communities don't. All of that money that Brookline is getting has essentially disappeared. But the same hasn't happened in, say, Melrose, because Melrose simply doesn't have that revenue from those sources. They have state aid and property tax. We have state aid, property tax, and these other things that have largely vanished. Boston, suffering. Cambridge, Somerville, suffering. Cape communities, tourist communities in the Berkshires are going to be suffering. But most communities don't get revenue from that. And on top of that, the reason why we're dealing with this now is because Brookline is aggressively putting together a municipal budget for the coming fiscal year now. Most towns in Massachusetts aren't doing that. They're saying, we'll do 1 12th budgeting for each month going forward. And that deficit, that reduction in spend, we're going to eat in the second six-month period. So these other communities are going to be really struggling in the spring because they didn't spread the pain over the fall and the spring like we're doing. Okay, They're going so, to suffer more later as a result. So let me just clarify that. So uh, this alternative budgeting scenario that you're talking about was authorized by the emergency legislation that was passed on Beacon Hill and signed by Governor Baker a couple of months ago, right? The, yes. Doing the one twelfth budgeting essentially. Yes. Okay, so I, I hear what you're saying that that for the communities that are doing that, it, it might uh, push away the pain for six months, but alternatively, it also buys them six months to find um, solutions to their financial, to their, to their budget gaps. I mean, what I'm hearing is there are potentially other revenue sources, an override, rainy day fund, maybe from the federal government, et cetera, that could come through for Brookline in that same period of time. So let me just turn back to our school committee members here for a second, and then, then Tommy, I'll let you mm -hmm. also answer this question. I mean, Suzanne or David, has the school committee considered at all you doing, um, I don't know if it's the town that has to or the school committee, but the, the 112 budgeting scenario that Tommy Vitola was talking about? Yeah, I mean, it's, it's come up, and I don't, it's not our decision to do that, is it, David? I mean, it's, it's the town decision. Okay. So we have to do what the, I mean, it's come up in conversation, town school partnership, but it's not our decision to make. The budget has to be the same throughout the town. Is that right, Tommy? That's right. right? Yeah. That's right. It's effectively town meeting writes the school committee a single check for hundreds of millions of dollars. And it's the school committee's sole responsibility to decide how to spend it. But they don't decide how big the check is. Town meeting decides how much money the school committee is authorized to spend. Okay, so what you're saying though, just so that I'm clear that we all understand this correctly, is that Brookline has opted to, as, as you said, aggressively budget for the next fiscal year, rather than taking this alternative path. Do you mm -hmm. think it's a good idea? Well, I mean, I think about it from a personal level. If, if one of the two breadwinners or the only breadwinner took a severe pay cut, and you had some savings, do you trust that that breadwinner will get the, get the job back in time? Or do you start trimming back now just in case he or she doesn't, right? And that's essentially the decision the town is making. And the federal government isn't like an individual worker because the federal government can deficit spend. But in many ways, a local government 
is sort of like an individual household in that budgeting sense. And so the town is concerned that the federal money might not show up, that chapter 70 money might not materialize in the way folks are hoping, that the economic recovery is slow, not quick. And if that happens, then is it better to have a single school year with roughly the same kind of resources in spring and fall? Or do you want to blow through fall as if nothing's wrong and then have even more severe cuts in the spring? And that applies, of course, not just to the school, that applies to the DPW and that applies to other social services, right? And I think that loosely speaking, the town's vision is for the most part, if we get more money, we'll add things back, but we don't want to take things away later in the same budget cycle. I think mm -hmm. that's the way I would describe it. Is it the right way to do it? You know, that's, that's not my say. I am a town meeting member by, by lieu of being a state representative, but, but um, really, it's, it's, it's a town government decision. So I'll ask you one more question, Tommy, and then I'll turn back to Suzanne um, and David. But folks want to know how, uh, how you think we or people can organize to push for federal relief for states and locals and how that conversation, well, we know how that conversation intersects with budget discussions here, but what can people do? So the, the, the first and most obvious thing to do is to start reaching out to legislators at federal, state, and local level and tell them to raise your taxes. Tell them who you are, tell them your name and your address and your phone number and say, I want to pay more in taxes for more services. Clear as day, right? Um, people need to hear that. Legislators need to hear that. Legislators as a body are terrified of raising taxes always, um, more so than I'd like. And uh, so doing that matters. It matters most, frankly, at the local level, because that's where an individual who's motivated can really move the needle. A single individual who really wants something done in this town can work hard and work smart and actually materially affect the future of this town. And we see it all the time. At the who federal level- Who should they call? Who should they call? Who should they email in this town? If they, if they want uh, to raise taxes, they should contact the select board at a minimum. Um, they should also feel free to contact their town meeting members and the candidates in their precinct who are running for town meeting. The election is Tuesday, June 9th. If you, there are a thousand people on this call, maybe not all 1,000 are eligible to vote, but the ones who are show up to vote on June 9th and let every single one of your elected officials at the local, at the state level, this is me, call me, 617-872-8921. Email me, tommy.vitolo at mahouse.gov. I will reply to you. I will read it, I will listen, and I will reply. And you may not love what I have to say, and I may not be able to do what you want, even if I want it too, but if you don't ask, you're not gonna get. So start right, hold, asking. Hold that card up again. People can't write that fast. Hold it up again. 617-872-8921 and then tommy.vitolo at mahouse.gov. Ma okay. Uh, well, Representative Vitolo, thank you here. I might um, jump back to you uh, if more okay. questions specifically regarding um, the state come up, but thank you for that um, very much. Now, Suzanne and, and David, we've got Gary Schiffman from Brooklyn High yep. sent us clarification of what he was talking about. He said under a, a normal scenario would be the school committee or the district tells the high school to cut 5%, the approximate value of the budget shortfall. Then the high school will reduce their budget through targeted savings, specifically a combination of attrition and limited non-renewals. We have used this process repeatedly during his 14 years at BHS, so why not this time? Yeah. You know, it's, I, I think we still should use it. I mean, if we, if, when we learn what the attrition rate is going to be, when we learn, uh, maybe early retirements, you know, all of that can play into uh, what the actual numbers will be and how people will be. I mean, I would, I would hope that we still have those kinds of, uh, that kind of input and those suggestions on where those cuts may come from, because that's what we need. You know, we need to know exactly where we need to uh, backfill positions, where positions uh, can go vacant for a year. That would be very helpful to us. I would not discourage that at all. Hmm. So uh, 
there's another question here, and David, I'll just toss this one to you. Um, someone says, I would like to hear about the role of the teachers union and how that plays into this and what prospects for negotiation are for an alternative solution given the low trust environment and challenges with prior negotiations. I see the union as a partner because we both essentially want, ultimately want the same thing. We want to have a positive learning environment for both the educators and for our children. And so we are going to continue to meet. We're going to continue to negotiate. In terms of specifics, I can't get into that because of labor law. In terms of precise offers, I might go back and forth. But there will certainly be discussions and we do ultimately have that same macro objective. So I'm going to remain cautiously optimistic that we can uh, achieve a resolution to the situation that will enable the vast majority, if not all, of the educators who receive the RIFs to return. Now, I don't know if you can answer this, um, but would you as individual school committee members consider open negotiations? I personally support open negotiations. I always have. I think that it increases transparency. I think that the general public would benefit tremendously from being able to watch the back and forth between the school committee and school department and the uh, educators union. I think that uh, negotiations as a general matter ought to be open for that very reason because it helps clarify a lot of uh, confusion that we see in the community. There's a lot of he said, she said. If people can just watch directly, they will be able to interpret for themselves what's happening and how to move forward. I will say that we have started in, down that path with our silent observers. So this year in negotiations, uh, a number of educators attended that were not on the negotiating team. And so they were allowed to come and observe and they had interactions among themselves. So we, we have started down that path. Um, I don't know how much when they talk open, what exactly, I mean, you'd have to work out some of the details, but yeah, we have started down that path. Hmm. So um, let's step back here for a minute because I mean, you, you are both long-term members of this community and, and uh, lived here for a long time, worked, uh, worked on behalf of, uh, you know, as school committee members and in other, capa in other capacities for the town of Brookline. I mean, this has got to be hard. You, you know that this hit the this hit the, the, the community of, of learners, of families, of educators, really hard, right? And I just wanted to know what your thoughts were about that, about the, um, the pain and the emotional anguish that the community felt late last week. Suzanne? Yeah, I mean, I, I'm, not, I'm not surprised at all, of course. And it, you know, it's, I know it's hard. I know it's hard. I was a, I'm still an educator, but you know, for 15 years, I had a school in Boston as principal, and I would get my budget every year. And sometimes I, there were a couple of years at the end where I would go to central office and I would say, I just can't balance the budget. I just can't do it. You did not give me enough money. It was, it was more uh, at the school level, which actually I'd like to have happen here, but I know how painful that is. And, uh, I, I am really, I am sorry for the stress and the pain and the anxiety that this has created. I'm not surprised, but I, I it still, once it happens, you just feel terrible about it. Uh, what I want to say is that our intention is to get everybody, as many, many, many people as we can back and to have a full functioning school system. And as we always do, we'd love to have everybody back in the building. We don't know that that will happen, but that's certainly our goal. And, uh, I just, I just ask people to take a deep breath. There's no reason for them to trust me, but I will do my very best to, uh, to make this work the way it needs to work and, and that we will work with people. You know, if, if their job is uh, temporarily suspended, we will look for other positions for them. We will look at attrition, we will look at early retirement, and we will do our very best. We do, there's not anybody that we want to lose this is not a way to weed out people. It's not a way to make people uncomfortable and hope that they leave. That's not at all what we want to do. And I, I think if we 
work together in a partnership, we can make this work. I do. I, I do believe that. David? Well, I addressed this earlier, but I think that the main pain and torments that people are feeling is the anxiety of not knowing where their future lies. And for that reason, I'm committed, as is Suzanne and other school committee members, I'm quite sure, of trying to resolve that uncertainty so that people can know what is going to, as much as possible, what will occur come the fall. So this is not something that we want to leave lingering indefinitely, absolutely not. We need to put together an educational program for the fall, whether it's remote learning, hybrid, uh, or completely back in the building, whatever it may be. We need to work out those contingencies and we need to try to contact those who have received the RIFs as soon as possible once we have greater clarity around what that will look like and the scale of each program. Uh, so the uncertainty is one of the things that people are struggling with, but it seems to me also that people are struggling with what feels to them as a breach of trust or um, kind of a, 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 the, the cold hand of an ax that seemingly came down um, with no warning. Now I know, look, we have been in a very difficult economic situation for a while, so perhaps it shouldn't have been a surprise, but there's a gap here. I think there's, there's, a, there's a community gap, an emotional gap that is frankly the thing that's making it hard for us as a community to, to come together and find a solution here. Do you, do you, do you, David, do you acknowledge that, that that gap exists or? Absolutely, so communication has long been a challenge in this community in a variety of contexts and always we want to be respectful of others and we want to demonstrate the appreciation that we have for them and we absolutely appreciate our educators and we hate that this has happened uh, and moving forward you, you talked about open bargaining for example uh, I think that any opportunity to improve transparency to increase openness will facilitate improved communication. Well, um, on that note, there was a question. Sorry, things are moving around here a little bit. Um, get, yeah, go ahead, Suzanne, please. Well, I just want to jump in. You know, I, I just want to acknowledge that, uh, you know, if the trust had been there all along, if we had really a solid working relationship with uh, community and families and with the teachers unions, this would not be quite as painful because we would say, we know we can weather this together. And so now we're asking people to, to commit to doing that. And, you know, you have to earn people's trust. And right now um, it's, it's been broken for a while. So that's, that is one of our goals is, is to work this through together so that we can trust each other to do the very best we can and to do the right thing for our children. That, that's what we have to keep going back to. Well, yeah, and Suzanne, to just lean on your, your own experience um, as an educator and principal, having been on, on that side of the equation, what, what steps, what concrete steps could the school committee take to rebuild that trust? Well, if, if I dare say, I think tonight is, is a mini, a baby step, you know, to, to be more available, to listen to people's questions, to try to answer the hard questions the best we can, knowing that, you know, we, we will make some uh, mistakes along the way, but, you know, we're willing to uh, rethink them, to learn, to listen to people. Uh, so, you know, it, that's what it takes. You have to earn people's trust and respect. And we need to do that by having better communication, more communications, more opportunities for exchanges, uh, letting people in on some of these hard decisions so we don't have to make them all alone. Sometimes it feels like we're in a room with nine of us trying to make the best decisions, but we, we need to do that to work very closely with the union so that we are partners in this, to work with the uh, town meeting, to work with the select board. So again, it's, it's a lot of work, but it's worth it if people feel that their elected officials are doing what is best for our community and for our students. And we have some work to do to, to regain a trust that was lost a little while ago. It's not just, just now, but what happens is it becomes more apparent 
when you're in a crisis like the pandemic, right? This, suddenly we are asking people to, to work with us and, and to trust us. And if it's not there, it won't happen overnight. So we have some, we have some work to do. Well, I, also to yeah, this, I also just want to take this opportunity to note that the distress that the community is feeling, as painful and difficult as that is, I would like to try to flip that around into a positive in the sense that it shows how deeply people care. I would actually be far more concerned if I were not having my inbox flooded, if I were not hearing from anyone, if there were community indifference, because indifference would tell me that we're not going to get closer to a solution. But when everyone is uh, really fixated on the problems and really committed to resolving them and moving along the process, then that actually tends to uh, yield a positive result. You know, uh, I'm glad to hear you say that. I would also say that there wouldn't be a hope in heck that a town like Brookline wouldn't respond powerfully to what has happened. <laughs> um, we really truly would have entered a absolutely alternative universe if your email inbox was not, had not been flooded. But to your point, David, you're making an important one. And I, I would just like to offer a little bit of what I have observed over the past year of watching school committee meetings is that one of the reasons there might be some frustration is that the times when the community, and speaking just from the parent community, uh, the times when people have felt that they have organized and have communicated and have become active to advocate for certain things, um, there was public hearings, people got to talk, uh, the school committee said, you know, nodded its heads and said yes, et cetera, but then nothing happened. Um, and I will point to the example of the pre-COVID budget where at least twice you heard from dozens and dozens of members of the parent community saying, please look to central administration to begin your cuts there. And ultimately the budget that the interim superintendent presented and that the school committee voted on on February 15th contained no such cuts. Those cuts didn't come until the pandemic. So that's what I'm saying that um, it's, I deeply appreciate you, you, do, you acknowledging that there's work to be done. Um, but as you know, it's because of specific experiences that the community has had. And hopefully this can be an antidote or the beginning of an antidote to those experiences. Um, and you're free, you're, you're free to respond to that. And if not, then I've just got two more questions for you before I let you off the hook tonight. I, I certainly appreciate the tenor of your remark, but I, I do feel we actually have already improved in that area of community engagement listening. And I'll offer the example of the Clark Road lease, which initially was intended to uh, move peer students from some combination of kindergarten through grades two. The parents came, they said, please don't do this. We really don't wanna split our community. We also heard from the Beep community on Beacon Street, please don't close us down in order to pay for the Clark Road lease. We listened. So there are certainly times where we will listen whenever feasible, but you're right, there's, you can always improve. And I, I will just um, uh, buttress what you said, because I was at that, at that school committee meeting where parents were, uh, came and advocated passionately for Beep on Beacon. And that same night, the, I believe the exact same night the school committee did take a vote to save Beep, Beep on Beacon. So it happened. So let's have it happen more often. Now, on that point, my last uh, two questions. First is, again, it is remarkable and heartening that a thousand people are watching this. So what should those 1,000 people do to save their schools right now? What can families and parents uh, do to, uh, to make sure that we rehire uh, our educators as quickly as possible, Suzanne? Yeah, I mean, I, uh, what can they do? Well, they can keep letting us know, but we, we've heard, I mean, we have heard from people. Um, they need to follow, follow the news and what we're doing. They can attend on a uh, watch on Monday night. They can speak up on Thursday. They can uh, talk to the town meeting members, as, as Tommy said. Uh, they can talk to the select board. I mean, we, it, we need to do this all together. And uh, it isn't just the school committee's challenge, although we certainly are, are working it, but it, it's a 
community effort together. And, you know, there are some uh, uh, family members who are uh, residents who are making suggestions and uh, doing some homework and looking to see how we, uh, our, our assessments run here in Brookline compared to Newton and Wellesley and other communities. And so I say thank you to those who are really trying to come up with constructive ideas. I, I mean, I think that's as helpful as anything. I know that people are upset and it's okay to hear that, but it's, it's particularly helpful when people say, and how about this idea? And they do a little homework and, and present that to us. Um, so those are some ideas, yeah. You know, as we said, the state level, the federal, those are all important as well. I'm sending letters off all the time to people, you know, asking for, for uh, help. So, David? I, I would agree with much of what you said and also what Tommy mentioned earlier, that school committee, uh, we do not have unilateral control over a, a lot of these funding issues. Uh, actually, we have none at all in terms of what the no direct control that is in terms of the appropriation we receive. So I would recommend uh, writing to your town meet, contacting your town meeting members, contacting members of the select board, the town administrator, because there are a lot of stakeholders here in terms of who controls the, the purse and they all need to be brought in and they all need to be involved in order for us to uh, alleviate the situation we find ourselves in. Can I also just say, you know, if people don't know a fact or even if they think they've got a fact, but they're not sure, they should contact one of us to check. Um, I'll give you an example. I think we got a letter saying, um, not only are we making bad decisions, but that we should be willing to give up our salaries towards the, uh, the, the, the budget. Well, you know, for the record, we don't get salaries. So, you know, th there's just a lot of confusion about what we can do and who we are. And uh, we are elected officials. We can be voted out for sure. But uh, we are trying to represent, uh, you know, the citizens and the residents of the town. And Magna, if I could, speaking of voting, um, June 9th is the town election. There's over 100 candidates across town. So you can read up about the candidates running for town meeting. The select board candidates is a competitive race. And decide how you're going to vote and let your neighbors know. Let your friends know get people to the polls. It absolutely influences uh, the will of town meeting. It absolutely influences the select board and they're the ones ultimately gonna decide how much money in the budget goes to the public schools from the town resources. And so make sure you're voting and make sure you're voting from an informed position. Tuesday, June 9th, it's coming up, cast your vote. Well, um, we just got a couple of minutes left. And I think, um, I know that there's actually many more than one, I've just been told there's many, many more than 1,000 people watching. There's just 1,000 people on Zoom and several hundred more uh, on Facebook. So I know that many of, of, of you watching are going to be happy with what you heard. Some of you will not be not be happy. Um, there were many questions that we couldn't get to and I do apologize for that. It's a fact of life in these kinds of forums. Um, but I do want to express my profound thanks to, to David and Suzanne uh, and Tommy for doing this because I'm not sure a forum of this size has ever been done before. And the, and the most important thing aside from the novelty of it is what you said, Suzanne, that hopefully it's a first step in a continuing very important process of building trust and conversation. So thank you for being our guinea pigs on this. And I hope that you come back soon uh, to do it. But I was just wondering if before I hand this back to Ben and Lauren at BPO, if you had any last remarks um, or thoughts to share with the community that's watching. Suzanne, do you any last? Yeah, I, do, I want to say thank you for watching. I want to say thank you, Magna, for, for being a great moderator, even with the tough questions. And, you know, if you got people... off easy, Suzanne. Come on. I know, I know. I know. Thank you. And, uh, you know, if people like this, if this work, maybe they don't like all the answers, but I mean, if they like the format, they should let people know. And, you know, we can, it'll happen again. I, I, I think it's important. I think there are other things we can do as well. And so, um, yeah, thank you. Thank you for this opportunity. Thank you. 
to the BPL for this. I also would like to thank you, Meghna, and you, Suzanne, and Tommy, and Ben, and Lauren, and everyone who put this together and who participated. I want to thank everyone in the public who is watching, and uh, I con will continue to welcome your ideas and your input and your feedback, because anyone who can, it's really all hands on deck, so all the help that we can get, we, we truly do appreciate. Uh, we truly do make an effort to uh, read everything that comes in, to process it, and to try to move forward together productively. And essentially, that's what we're going to have to do in order to reach a resolution. We're going to have to come together as a community. All of the stakeholders are going to need to be involved. Thank you, David. And I've got two asks of the thousands of viewers. Number one, continue to be vigilant about COVID-19. Be champions at hand washing. Wear your masks outside and don't go wandering around town just because you're bored. We really need to continue to turn the screws on this terrible disease and everyone has a role to play in that. And number two, I want you to say George Floyd's name out loud. I want you to spend some time thinking about it. It's, it just matters. So please do that too. Thank you. Thank you, Tommy. Uh, and thank you everyone for allowing me to uh, moderate this session today. Thank you to Lauren and Steve, uh, Lauren and Ben as well, and I will hand it back to them now. Hi, everybody. Um, thank you so much, Magna. Thank you, Suzanne. Thank you, David. Thank you, Tommy, um, for, for joining us and for um, answering you know, maybe what one fifth of the questions that we that we got. Um, so thank you to everybody for 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 attending and for giving us giving you know asking all of these questions. I wish we had you know, three hours to to get to all of them. Um, and you know, as we're just very happy that that David and Suzanne and and and, and Tommy as well were able to do this on on such short notice. And. Um, and we hope to, yes, to be able to do more, more events like this in the future. Um, please let us know if it was helpful. Um, again, as I said before, I apologize if we didn't get back to, to many of you over email or, or, or whatever else. Um, and, you know, the last thing I'll say before we're handing it off to Lauren is that whatever concrete steps we heard to make sure that we fund our schools and that we you know, get all of our teachers, all of our educators, all of our teachers, all of our parents, all of our specialists, all of our educators rehired as quickly as possible. I think, and I hope as a community, we can come together to do that quickly um, and, um, and, you know, with, with coordination and with trust. So thank you, everybody. Um, I'm gonna be the farewell. Uh, person saying farewell tonight. Um, thank you everyone for attending. Um, you know, the, these are sobering times. Uh, you know, we have riots going on. We have a pandemic. Um, we have this terrible situation with layoffs that we hope will not come to, to pass in a, any kind of permanent fashion. Um, many people have been writing during the, the program, you know, what can we do? What can I do? Um, and I think we've made it clear, you know, to our community attendees, um, I would urge you not only to, to write school committee members, I would urge you to write advisory committee members. Um, I will make sure that those emails, uh, we can put them on the uh, Brookline Parents Organization website. Um, those are the people who allocate and reallocate money, as you heard. Uh, one day after pink slips went out, uh, they found two million bucks. Uh, so I think, I think that writing advisory committee uh, is, is an important step. And to our educator attendees, thank you for what must be uh, a, for attending in what's a very hard time for you. We are we are all thinking creatively uh, of ways that we can make it possible, and we are fairly confident that we can make it possible for many, many, many of you to stay in Brookline. And we thank you for the service you've given, and that you hopefully will continue to give. Um, I just want to give out two pieces of information. Um, Brookline Parent, the BPO's uh, website is brooklineparents.org. And if you want to write us uh, at that, it is info at brooklineparents.org. Um, we will do our best to field questions to, you know, town uh, bodies that, that are the best ones. And we will list the um, emails 
of advisory committee members, particularly the school subcommittee. I think that's important. Those are important people to be contacting. Thank you again for attending. Um, let's, let's all work on this together and find a solution. Good night. Good night.